This is a recording of the Sunday, January 17, 2016 meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca. And this morning, our speaker is John Int, who we had here a few weeks ago talking about sexuality, which is really a fun and interesting meeting. And today, it's happiness is the topic. There's probably a relationship there. Anyway. <laughs> John Ince. Thank you. Well, how nice to see some of you again. And um, a little shift in, in topic uh, to today, happiness. And so I'm going to start with describing how I transited from sexuality to happiness as a subject. Um, does anybody, we've already heard of a link between them, um, happiness, any other links? <laughs> Sexuality, happiness? Um, aren't they the same? <laughs> they're, aren't they the same? <laughs> For they're some both, people. Well, they're, they're, <laughs> both, they're what? Well, Nothing. Well, the last one were having sex. Which was, yeah, <laughs> laughter, <laughs> happiness, sex, happiness, <laughs> laughter. They're both feelings. They're both heavily involved in the world of feeling. And so having finished uh, The Politics of Lust and liking to write a book once a decade, I decided that uh, my next book would also be on a feeling. And at about that time, there was a lot of uh, media material on the burgeoning science of happiness. And so I started researching the science of happiness. And um, I developed a theory of happiness that integrated branches of the science of happiness that I haven't seen integrated before. And I'd like to introduce to you tonight. This morning. Uh, this morning. <laughs> Sorry. I just woke up. Yeah. yeah. Not, not really woken up yet. Okay. So maybe I should go to my uh, list so I don't get off track. So the radical idea that I've come to is that most of us are living at a level of happiness that is, like, metaphorically speaking, here when we could be up here. So with relatively easy tweaks in our life, we could be substantially boosting our happiness. I call that difference between here where most of us live at and here where we could be living the happiness gap. And so that's my claim that in our society today, very few of us are maximizing our happiness. So I'd ask you guys to just do a quick assessment of yesterday, to re review the events of yesterday. And for people like me, that's sometimes hard to do, what happened yesterday. But actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I can rec recollect some of the events. And I'm asking you to do like an emotional assessment. What were your highs and your lows in the day? Did you have any serious highs? Was there a moment where you said, wow, I am so happy. You actually said that in your mind to yourself. <laughs> so when most people I ask to do that little exercise, they go, yeah, there's a little bit here and a little bit there. But there wasn't really a sense of joy. And I believe by nature, and I'll come back to this idea of by nature, what I mean by it. By nature, we are designed to feel that joy every day. That's, that's in our DNA. And so the happiness uh, project that I'm going to be introducing you guys to is aiming to bring that into your day. So you wake up in the morning truly rested so that uh, there's real connection with people in your day. There's a sense of satisfaction interacting with other people. So there's a sense of sensual enjoyment in your day that you actually go, wow, this cup of coffee is amazing, or this chocolate is sublime. Mm. Mm. That instead of just consuming, uh, of having pleasures, we are able to stand back and go, wow, those were delicious pleasures. So that's our aim, 
is to have a day filled with little joy bursts. So why the gap? Why, why are people mostly living here when they could live up here? And the major reason is we, even progressive thinkers like us humanists, mostly follow our social institutions, mostly follow the patterns that were introduced to us by our family and our friends. And they actually didn't know much about happiness. They didn't really reflect on it. And they didn't teach us to reflect on it. And it's an interesting thing, for example, an indicator of the lack of attention given to happiness and positive emotions generally, that it was only in the 1990s that science really seriously started to look at happiness. Way back since Freud, for over 100 years, science has been studying negative emotions, psychopathology, unhappiness. But the opposite end of the register hasn't had a lot of attention until recently. And we can, we can see the same trend in, in health, that disease got all the attention for three, 400 years of, of medicine. And then only since the 70s, this concept of wellness come in, where, where medicine started to look at not just healing diseases, but making us as healthy as we can be and, and studying how we can do that. So the long and short of it is that our social institutions, our families, haven't really known much about what makes a happy life. And we follow them, and it's sort of the blind leading the blind, the unhappy leading the unhappy. And fast forward to about the 1990s, and science starts to really look at it. So today there are thousands of scientists all over the world studying happiness in various different disciplines. And a huge amount of data has emerged about what makes us happy. And it turns out that a lot of what we do throughout most of our day doesn't really make us happy. That most of us are spending substantial amounts of our life doing things that at some level aren't deeply fulfilling. So one of the most important discoveries of science is that there are actually a small number of activities that make people happy. And these emerged in cross-cultural studies. When they look at aboriginals in Australia and office workers in Vancouver and farmers in Africa, and they surveyed them about the high points and the low points in their day. And they start to see a common theme in the high points. And I actually recommend that you do something, just, just a fun exercise, is, takes about three minutes, is get a piece of paper and at the end of the night, keep it by your bed, at the end of the day, chart today, what was your high point and what was your low point? And chart tomorrow and chart tomorrow. And you will start to see after 30 days some patterns in your highs and lows. Well, science started to discover this uh, in the last 20 years, and there are roughly about 20 things that they have identified as are key to happiness. Example one, this isn't going to come as much of a surprise, social interaction. When people interact together, they tend to be happy. There's been some interesting research just done in the last couple of uh, weeks about charting happiness through the week. And the first four days of the week aren't particularly happy. And it's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday <laughs> that people get happiest. And it's not just because they're not working, actually. The main thing is they're socializing. And this is one problem that, that uh, happiness theoreticians are thinking about. What if we go away from the true seven day week where everybody is on their own schedule, there's no weekends anymore that everyone is taking, there'll be less opportunity to socialize, this could be a problem. So finding number one, social interaction is a critical ingredient of happiness. And an associated finding 
is that the deeper you go into your social connection, the more intimate it is, the more you share feelings about your life and your conversationalist's life, the happier you will be when you are in that conversation, as opposed to talking about the weather or something less personal. Another major discovery, that movement is a critical ingredient of happiness. Now, science has long known that we need to move to be healthy. But a relatively recent discovery is that we need to move to be happy. And um, a third discovery was that spending time in nature is a critical ingredient of happiness. That when people report, like in their day, when they, when they were happiest, it was walking on the seawall and looking out over the, the sea as opposed to walking in the mall. And there's been some amazing health discoveries about contact with nature. You guys might have heard some of these studies. They've received a lot of publicity. They, they have the same, uh, pa the patients recovering from the same operations, one looking into uh, one side of the hospital, looking into buildings, the other side of the hospital, looking into trees. And lo and behold, the people looking into the trees are discharged 25 to 35% sooner. The only difference in their care was they looked out into nature. Mm -hmm. So these are just three examples of what I'll call the ingredients of happiness, and there are about 20. So the question is, like, why are there just a few ingredients of happiness? And science has started to develop an answer for that. And it has to do with our genetic nature, and it has to do with the evolution of our emotions. So basically, our emotions are a form of intelligence, a primitive intelligence that other animals have that are designed to guide us to the things that help us survive and move us away from the things that injure us. So if we develop, say, an emotional attraction to movement and that enhances our survival, um, that gene will tend to spread. Whereas if we develop an attraction, what makes us really happy is existing as a couch potato. And that's not going to enhance our survival. Those genes will disappear. Another example, if through evolution we develop uh, an attraction to being closely bonded with other people, and that enhances our survival, that gene will tend to spread. If we're a loner, if we love being on our own, we like hanging out separate from everyone else, and that's more dangerous, those won't be passed on. Well, it turns out for two million years, two million years basically, hominids are humans and prehumans in our line. Have, uh, have, we've evolved and our emotions formed in a very specific environment. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. Uh, uh, in, in Africa. And what what were what were some of the features of that lifestyle? Well, it was a uh, grassy. We were on the ground. Um, Semi-arid type of. Life. And we moved a lot. We were nomadic. So for two million years, we didn't open refrigerators and pull out dinner. We had to walk every day, they estimate, 10K every day. We had to walk to gather and hunt to eat. So if you developed an emotional attraction in that environment to movement, you had a survival advantage. Your genes replicated. If you didn't like to do that, you weren't so interested in going over the next hill to see what was there, your genes died out. Over millions and millions of years, the whole species developed the emotional attraction to movement. Similarly, in a hunter-gatherer society, one of the features is you lived in bands of from 20 to 40 people. 
you could not survive more than two or three days on your own. You were dead meat walking in a country filled with predators like lions. But in a group, you were highly secure. The people that liked to hang out in a group, who enjoyed making rich connections with others, who when they were sick, the others helped them and reciprocally, they had a survival advantage. The loners died out. We inherited the genes of those people who loved social connection. And same, the people who love nature that we, we know today that a reverence for something tends to create curiosity for that which is loved. People who really loved nature were more curious about it. They learned more about nature. They had a tendency to survive than people who were ambivalent about that subject. So the, the, you see the pattern that the things that were essential for survival in this weird environment that we can barely imagine, which is where our genes came to be formed, the things that were essential for survival, our genes naturally evolved to be attracted to. That's the nature of emotional evolution. And so there's this bizarre mismatch. We have a genetic orientation designed for an environment that we can barely imagine. But people say, well, wait a minute, we've been out of the uh, hunter-gatherer environment for roughly 10,000 years. That's when the agricultural revolution came and our lifestyle changed dramatically. We no longer moved, we had farms. And we no longer had to have a band of 30 or 40 people to look after us. We could just have a small family unit. And uh, we didn't really have to be close to the wider nature that we were in. We only had to be close to our, um, our farm. And the interesting thing is that I was fascinated to discover is that for the 10,000 years, human health has declined in the agricultural revolution. We actually got shorter. That on the African plains, we were uh, taller, our we often imagine that life then, there's the famous, who was it that said nasty, brutish, and short? Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, that's right. So there's this image that primal man lived a terrible life. But today, more and more evidence is uh, emerging that it was, it was a lot actually happier than now. Jared Diamond, you guys must know Jared Diamond. He called agriculture the worst mistake in human history because it turns out by nature we're not designed to be living close to animals. We get older diseases. We're not designed to be living in close quarters with, other, with others. We get their diseases. And, and, and um, we're in what a fascinating discovery of modern science is that people living close to the land today, and there are fewer and fewer of them, have no depression that the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, experts on depression call an antidote to <coughs> depression. So the macro idea that I'm um, trying to express is that a part of us is designed for a world that no longer exists. And that's why there's a happiness gap, because we don't fundamentally know about these primal, these 20 primal ingredients of happiness. It turns out, for example, when people do surveys, that most people are intensely sedentary. And there's this new thing. It's like sitting is the new smoking. Have you heard that idea? <laughs> it's so dangerous to our health to be sitting every day. And I carry a pedometer on me. When you can measure something, you're more motivated to do it. By nature, our body and our emotions want us to be moving around 10,000 steps a day. Most of us only move in the 4,000 range. On nature, most of us live di relatively divorced from nature. We're really lucky in Vancouver. Many of us choose to live here precisely because of its proximity to nature. But in most of the developed world, people have a very small connection with nature. Similarly, social connection. Um, have you heard of the book Bowling Alone? Um, uh, uh, a whole, the disappearing neighbor, 
literature on the declining sociality of our culture brought on by the prevalence of media and many other forces. So that like in, in uh, 40 years ago, um, they would interview people, how many close friends do you have that you could tell the most personal thing? And most people responded five or six. And today it's two, and one of them is your partner. Two people that you can tell anything to. We're used, by nature, we're used to having a clan of 10 to 20, 30 people that we're intimately bonded with. So the absence of these nutrients is what I say is the reason for the happiness gap. And an analogy is, is vitamins. So a really sort of neat illustrating story was in the early 1900s, at times in the United States, there were hundreds of thousands of people sick at the same time. Like literally in parts of the US Southwest, the economy came to a halt. And people had no idea what was going on. They thought it was some sort of infection. They, they couldn't understand it. And, but they quickly, when people left, they recovered. And to make a long story short, what it was was the new consumerism was coming in. And packaged food started to be sold. And to extend the shelf life of packaged food, they had to start to take out the germs have, have we talked about this issue? No. You and I know. It's somebody else. Yeah, 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 yeah we did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The germ of the brain. That's right. And <laughs> be, to extend the shelf life, they would take out the, the germ of the grains. But it turns out the germ had critical nutrients in many places in the Southwest. Corn, for example, was an essential deliverer of the vitamin B12 or B3. B3, I think it was. B3. And the absence of this gave them pellagra. And I, I sort of see that as a nice little uh, uh, metaphor for what's going on emotionally, is that modernity has brought us things that is depriving us of essentials, that we all have the equivalent of a low-grade vitamin deficiency, but it's emotional. So that's a bit of a bad news story. <laughs> We've all got emotional pellagra. We'll call it that. That's the, the name for a vitamin B3 deficiency. So, can we get this story a little upbeat? What what time do you want me to? <laughs> oh, but we want to have questions and answers. Oh, okay. So I can go to 11:30. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. So, um, I I went. Well, this is interesting. Um, how can we change that situation? And well, the obvious answer is to start to identify these nutrients of happiness. I call them primal nutrients of happiness because they're really dictated by the genetic code, which is a product of uh, the hunter-gatherer era. And by the way, 10,000 years isn't enough to change anything other than superficial genetic differences like skin color, lactose tolerance, intolerance, but not our deep tissue uh, emotional genetic structure, which is why when they do surveys all over the world, they don't find like Aborigines love to move and office workers uh, but, but don't like nature and office workers like nature but don't like to move. There's a universality of, of what makes us happy and that's because the human genome in, in that area we all share. So um, we've got to bring the nutrients of happiness into our life. So I started looking at the nature of change. And there's, again, this is one of the exciting things. That there is science now, right? The burgeoning number of students who are teaching, um, who are getting PhDs, more PhDs than ever before, more human brain power being applied to real important problems, not just like what's going on in outer space or how to kill better uh, with your armaments, but really important issues like actually, how do people change? And the news isn't very good. It turns out, and, and you're gonna be hearing 
much more about this as the, as the science starts to get more popular. But the bad news is most of us are almost robots. Once habits form, mm -hmm. it's like we are sitting on a racing river. And it turns out that modern society is especially conducive to habit formation in the way our ancestors weren't. They had way more wild cards in their life, which changed their day-to-day -day existence and their month-to-month -month existence. Mm -hmm. I have slept mostly in the same bed for 18 years. This like, would be inconceivable to a hunter-gatherer. Like three weeks would be the longest they would be in the same piece of ground sleeping. We get up at the same time. We, because of natural lighting, we can extend when we go to bed and so on. We have office schedules. We have an immense uh, uh, coordination of our time. So that our, and they've done modern apps have looked at, uh, you have, you carry this on your smartphone and they map where you go throughout the day, day after day, month after month. And they can predict with 93% accuracy within two meters of where you will be at any time of the day. <laughs> and this applies even to people are traveling regularly. Oh, he's going to be on a plane. That's where he's going to be. <laughs> or he's going to be going to the toilet. And he is going to be peeing for exactly 3.4 seconds. 13. <laughs> it's unbelievably routinized our life. And it turns out that we need habits, right? That the human unconscious is the biggest information processing part of our brain. And the part of our brain that has to make cognitive assessments and decisions in the moment is a very small part of our brain. Call it a computer like RAM, as opposed to the disk where everything is stored. And we need habits to for example, pick up the coffee and not pour it in our ear, <laughs> pick, put it in our mouth. We can, we need to drive and habitually, like I drove here today and listened to a complex radio show. My cognitive advanced brain is intimately involved with that and I barely remember driving here. So we absolutely need a habitual part of our structure. But our modern society is radically increasing the amount of our life that is structured by habit. And so if we want to change our habits, what do we do? Well, it turns out there's science on that as well. And there's not only science, but there's thousands of years of observation. If you want to change, if you want to say, learn a new language, you've got to practice it. If you want to learn play the guitar. You've got to put time into it. If you want to uh, learn how to meditate or do yoga, you just can't automatically start touching your toes. You have to practice it and ease into it. And, and most of us know that at some level, that if we want something to change in our life, we have to invest in it. And so I started to think, well, okay, I've known a lot about happiness. Like this was a breakthrough for me. About year three in my research, I said I've virtually writ read everything there is on happiness. I've identified the ingredients of happiness. One day somebody said to me, but you, you must be a really happy guy. Mm -hmm. And I went, and, and you must have jumped in your happiness in the last, you know, you're your happiness gap must be declining. And I went, no, nothing's really changed. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing has really changed. I got all this information. When they said do the exercises, never did the exercises. That was boring. Because I had a habit of reading, loving to read, loving to ingest new information, sort it out, think about it, talk about it. But I didn't have any habit of applying what I was reading to, to change my life. And that's when I got into the behavior science. And that's when the behavior science started to realize we've just come through New Year's. The New Year's resolutions average on, on, on about th three to four weeks and then they die out. That 
we're incredible robots, so let's just shoot ourselves and go home. <laughs> so a, a happiness practice. You know, you've heard of yoga. What about like a yoga of happiness? What about like a disciplined, regular process by which I would methodically bring the ingredients of happiness into my life? And that's what I started to do. And it was a big struggle. It's, I started to look at the people who, you know, take a yoga workshop. They're into it. And like me, I was into it. I could sustain this regular daily practice of walking, getting my, my pedometer, and meditating regularly. But after a certain period of time, it sort of withered a bit. And just like the evidence said, most people who take a yoga workshop or a meditation workshop, they're really keen to do their practice. They do it for three, four weeks, and then they're lost back in their habit stream. And their life pretty much reverts to normal. So I'm very cynical about today about most personal growth. Um, I know there's some folks in the audience that have just completed uh, a, a wonderful personal growth program at the Haven. And I've had a lot of, this is a, an amazing growth center on, on, on Vancouver Island, or on uh, um, Gabriola Island. And one of the issues that I have with growth centers is that they get their, and, and programs like Landmark, have you guys heard of the Landmark? I've heard of it. Yeah, it's, it's like the, the Google of personal growth now. It's got like millions and millions of people enrolled in their programs and we can get all excited like I did even when I started fashioning my own happiness practice but unless there's real support that we tend to even with the enthusiasm of a workshop a yoga retreat a meditation unless there's something one that extends into our life we're going to get lost in that habit stream and we're going to revert <laughs> So says the science. So says my personal experience. We're going to revert to uh, our habits. It's so, so hard. To, I'll just give you an example. I, one of the projects is to eat mindfully. So I have a really, and most of us here, we have hundreds or maybe millions, especially at my age, of habits of how long I put a spoon in my mouth how the duration between different spoonfuls. <laughs> and I've started, it's incredibly ritual, like I've started to look at that and when my palate has like about a third of the food, it reaches for another <laughs> st a stimulus response thing. So until I fully chewed up one, I'm, or it's, it's half chewed up, now I'm getting unchewed up stuff. That's not a good formula for digestion, it turns out, and it's not a good formula for pleasure. There's a ton of pleasure in eating, and I'm mostly lost to it because I'm a head geek, and I'm thinking all the time, and I'm not having the checking in on the pleasure of this somatic experience. And so I've said to myself, this is what you're going to do today. You're going to eat mindfully and so on. And it's extraordinarily difficult. You know, I have a friend who will say, hey, are you eating mindfully right now? And I go, no, I haven't thought at all about it. And I've just been eating for, <laughs> for half an hour. <laughs> so that's, so how do we con, con, uh, counteract the, this habit stream? And it turns out, so we need a practice. We need a happiness practice. I call it joy shift. It's a practice. It's like think yoga, but of happiness without all the movements. But it turns out that almost nobody can do a practice on their own. <coughs> so the next big discovery, I think it's number five on my list, is that you need a community. It's just like what you guys have with the humanists. You have a community of like-minded people who you regularly come to talk about humanist issues, to hear people tell you about humanist issues in their talks like what I'm going. And it turns out we need like a community to support us in growing happier. And so what I'm trying to create 
is in Vancouver as sort of the pilot project to take over the world is a happiness studio. <coughs> Think like a yoga, a yoga studio. It's where I can teach people how to do the practice that I have now been doing with more success in the last year because I have created my own happiness community to support me and me to support others in doing the practice. And, and what that simply involves is methodically on a daily basis or every other day, spending from five minutes to 60 minutes doing things that bring in the nutrients of happiness. And so it's like a practice which is happy to do. And, you know, people when I give presentations like this, well, I don't have time for that. So you don't have time to be happy. No. And then I go, what is it that is more valuable than being happy? It's, it's really fascinating. What people often report is, well, you know, I say like you get home from work and what do you do? Well, you know, I make dinner and then I watch TV. But it turns out watching TV, there's all sorts of data on it. It doesn't lead to happiness. It's like not very happy and but it's a habit the idea of like breaking that turn on what's going on in in the Kardashians tonight you know like I just can't lose my hit and so it's you need support to like break those habits and um, there's a small number of people who are interested in doing that and um, I invite you to uh, read my book to check out my uh, um, website called joyshift.org and we're like at the ground floor of a, a new happiness community and my, my, my dream for the social implications of this is, you know, like I'm, like you guys, I'm really interested in, in changing society. I really see society as um, seriously screwed up and dangerous and so my idea is like like take the environmental crisis the environmental crisis global warming is fundamentally a product of the wrong happiness formula so the the, the traditional happiness formula not informed by science says that you'll be happier by getting lots of stuff lots of toys and playing with it so pursue devote a lot of your life to making money to buying things and it turns up that attitude is causing us to consume a massive amount of resources Canadians I think are the worst in the world in terms of our energy consumption partially because we're a cold climate and like if people could discover that there was a whole other route to happiness which is not materialism. Science shows that materialism does not deliver happiness. Media consumption, generally only a little bit of it, 15 to 45 minutes a day delivers happiness. That if, if we could find where the true ingredients of happiness are, we would have a lighter footprint in the world. So I see like literally, and, and war, what is war and hatred, but fundamentally a lack of happiness. Happy people don't want to fight and kill. So our, the, the sort of moral imperative of our world is to grow happy. So ironically, this movement that I'm trying to start, I see is not just one designed to you know, enhance the selfish happiness of the already totally lucky human being like me to live in this amazing society with all its words. But it's really the only hope that I can see for the world, unless we have a new happiness model, we're screwed. So um, get happy for the sake of the world. Any questions?